back to normal. All right. Now that Stephen is here, we can begin. Good morning, everybody, on the World Wide Web, and uh, welcome to all of you. We are continuing our journey through the second half of the book of Acts of the Apostles. So turn to Acts chapter 15. And for those of you who have a study guide, uh, we are in session two, and we're going to pray the prayer. So today is about, uh, Acts chapter 15 is about the council at Jerusalem. I'm sure some of you remember that because you were there. And um, all right, let's pray the prayer at the bottom of the page where it says, thank you, gracious Father. Everybody there? Let us pray. Thank you, gracious Father, for the fellowship of those who love you, who are brothers and sisters in your family. Forgive the times I think only of myself and touch my heart that I might be more sensitive to others and eager to share the gospel with them. Speak to my heart through your word and guide all my thoughts by your spirit. For I pray in Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, so turn to Acts chapter 15. I handed out a map. We'll come to that map at the end. Uh, we are continuing now with the uh, council at Jerusalem. Anybody remember the council? It was called the First Ecumenical Council of the Church. Um, and someone said the most important church council ever. Uh, anyway, the council at Jerusalem. What do I want to say about this before we read it? Um, oh, one of the things in these chapters, and the only reason I notice this is because of what I'm preaching on su Sunday on the Holy Spirit, is uh, the reporting. If you look at chapter 14, they report at the end of the chapter, if you go to the last verse, uh, on arriving, verse 27, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done. And then you come to our chapter there are two, I thought there were three times, maybe it's only two, two or three times where Paul and Barnabas report the work God is doing through them. And really goes back to the Holy Spirit. It's all, and Sunday's sermon is about the power of the Spirit uh, at work. All right, so let me begin. Let me read, okay? Chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch, and we're teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you can't be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. All right? Again, this is happening up in Antioch, which is north, far north of Jerusalem. Everybody know that? And this is where the Christian church really boomed among Gentile people. All right? And so they travel, this group of, they're, they're called, uh, what are they called? Pharisee Judaizers. They, they travel up north from Jerusalem, probably for a specific purpose to, what was their purpose? For, oh, well, probably cause trouble. Because they heard that people weren't getting circumcised. The new Gentiles weren't getting. So they're now teaching, unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. All right, so Paul and Barnabas, who are up there, are in big dispute. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go to Jerusalem. Notice going up to Jerusalem. To see the apostles and elders about this question. So the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, in other words, as they traveled south, they reported or told how the Gentiles had been converted in churches along the way. Okay, everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. All right. This news made all the brothers glad when they came to Jerusalem. They were welcomed by the church, the apostles and elders, to whom, here you have again what? Here's the third one. They reported everything, okay, God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, and this, of course, is in Jerusalem. Everybody got that, this location? The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Notice the difference between verse 5 
And the other verse, verse, um, da -da 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 -da, verse 1. Not only is it circumcision, now it is what? The law of the law. The, so the law of Moses. Okay, we're not, by the way, we're not talking what, we're not talking moral law here necessarily. That probably didn't even have a problem with. But they're talking what kind of ceremonial law. Everybody understand that? Okay. And we went through that year, a couple of years ago in the book of Numbers and, and where else? Leviticus. A lot of the things of the, okay, that they were part of the old covenant. All right. And now in the new covenant, the question is, does one need to follow these things to be saved? All right. So before we go on, uh, what do I want to share with you? So notice the debate. These were called Judaizers. Brothers went up and notice the, the distinction. All right? Um, so what is, the, what is the issue here? The issue is the struggle is to live by faith alone and grace alone. Okay? And as someone said, we always want to say faith and grace is not enough. Now, that doesn't mean obedience to God's will is unimportant. Everybody understand that? But it doesn't save you. It may, it may okay, everybody understand that? So we always want to kind of add something. And why do we do that as human beings? No, why do we do it as you? Why do we have a tendency to do that? We want to be in control, and we want to make sure God what? He owes me. He owes me. You know, I had somebody say, I went to church, so I, I, got, I, I got some more points. <laughs> now think about that. I'm going to church to get points with God. Holy cow. Think, how, think about, even if you joke about that, you got to kind of think, you know, God kind of owes me, Right? And sadly, I think there's a lot of people, all of us have this tendency. I have this tendency, don't you ever think, well, you know, God kind of owes me. After all, I'm a pastor. <laughs> yeah, I never miss church. Right? I should have so many points built up that, you know, although somebody said, oh, Pastor Barth, uh, you, you'll be in a different building. Have you ever been told that? In heaven. Someone told, told me that. Remember that, Marley? Someone said, you're going to be in a different building than, than the rest of us. Oh, no, no. I don't know. That wasn't the end. But anyway, just think about that. We always want to add something to the equation that God owes me. Okay? I'm better than you guys. And God, kind, he owes me. Because we're always inclined to works righteousness, Right? That's our human nature. You know, when you, do, when you do your, yeah, when you do your best job, you get promoted, right? You get a salary increase. So we think the same thing with God. And that's why God's ways are not our ways. Our temptation is, is to add standards and regulations. All right, let's move on. Now comes the apostles and elders. By the way, I, I forgot about this. There's basically two groups in, of leadership in the early church. And they were? No. Well, they were, yeah, okay. The, but the apostles, of course, there weren't that many of them. And the elders. Now, who were the elders? Other leaders in the church. Probably people who knew Jesus Personally, thank you, yes. And we're going to come to one of the elders, okay? The two, who are the two leading apostles in the early church? Other than Paul, you know, to the, but other than Paul. Peter and, and John, okay? Peter and John. And the leading elder, anybody want to guess? No, elder, elder. James. Stephen, yes. Stephen for a while, James, and others, okay? We don't, we, anyway. So that's kind of interesting, that there were two groups. All right, so let me go on. So the elders and apostles met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Now let's stop that. 
the first thing they did was what? No, I don't know about that. Maybe they did. But first thing they did, first thing they did was what? No, they had an open discussion about the issues, which means when there's an issue, you should what? Talk about it. Right. Yes. And it isn't my way versus your way, but you talk about it, and you talk about it in a good, honest, open communication. You can disagree, but you don't beat up the others. You understand that? Ever been in a voters meeting where one person stood up and beat up everybody? She's changing her head. Thank God, we don't haven't had those in a, have we? I don't remember. But boy, as a circuit counselor, I was in plenty of places, and if you're watching out there, and you probably know this, um, yeah, beat up on each other. Oh, yeah, ever had, oh. The worst is, someone gets up and pounds on the table. Has anyone ever experienced that in a meeting? Forgive me if I offend anyone but I have experienced pastors doing that. That is so scary, or certain. I can't remember a woman doing that, but a man I can remember, not a pastor. You know, that's terrible, just to beat up. He what? He pounded, got angry. Oh, all right. Well, anyway, well, the, you know, you got to be careful. The point is, they have an open discussion, right? And you have to allow for that. And we, it's, okay, maybe we take that for granted, but boy, a lot of places don't. Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Now, what was that episode? That's when Paul went to the house of Cornelius. Remember that? And he got, he got criticized for going to a Gentile house and eating. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them whom? The Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. By the way, this is huge. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Now I want to go back up to the Holy Spirit. I'm preaching on this Sunday because it's Confirmation Sunday. And in the book of John, Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit, there are numerous Holy Spirit, I forget the title of it, like verses. And that the Holy Spirit, of course, will follow Jesus. Everybody understand that? First of all, the Father sends the Son. The Son comes for a short period of time. And now the Holy Spirit follows the Son. And the Holy Spirit always comes and reveals the Lord Jesus Christ. So here comes the Spirit now who on Gentiles reveals the Lord Jesus and they come to faith, just as Jewish believers did. Everybody understand that? So that's Peter's argument. So how can we say that they need something more? Now, let me just go through my notes here on this. That's Acts chapter 10 where Peter is at the house of Cornelius. Remember that? He got in big trouble because he ate with Gentiles. All right? Uh, now we come to verse, yes, verse 9. Hearts purified by faith. Everybody see that? Uh, made no distinction. Uh, let's go to verse 10. Putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke. What was that yoke? Yeah, the obedience to the, the law. And nobody could keep it. Okay? Nobody could keep it. Verse 11, if you have your own Bible, you should highlight verse 11. Verse 11 is the gospel. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved 
they are saved, uh, we are saved just as they are. Okay, verse 11 is important. So the question of this council was, what is the meaning and function of the scriptures? Okay, number two, are circumcision and dietary laws still binding? Everybody see that? And can we have fellowship with such differences? Okay, all right, let's move on. So here we have Peter's speech. Let's see how everybody responds. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles. There you have another report, okay, in the same council. James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. You should understand that taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. See that? Who was the first people God picked? Israel, Israel, right? The people of Abraham, yes, all right? Now he's taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. Yeah, all right? The words of the prophets are in agreement with him. Here's prophet Amos. This is a little hard to understand. I'll try and explain it. After this I will return, the Lord says, and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild. That's a reference to what? The crumbling of Israel, okay? The crumbling of the children of Israel. And I will restore it. And the remnant of men may seek, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name. So after this, God will come and a remnant of all mankind will seek the Lord and bear his name as believers. By the way, you and I are, we're part of that remnant. Yeah, we're part of this group. He does, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. And the Jews sadly forgot about that, about the salvation of souls. All right. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to the Lord, all right? Instead, we should write to them, tell them to abstain from food polluted to idols, sexual immorality, meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city uh, on every Sabbath, okay? So here you have the Gentiles are now added to the foundation of Israel. Everybody see that? All right. So um, here you have the fourfold restrictions. Three of them, interestingly, are what? I would not have thought this so much. What are three of the four restrictions? No, three of the four restrictions. Food, dietary, yes. Let's talk about that. Food, abstain from food polluted by idols. Meat strangled and blood. Why is why are they on the list? <laughs> Anybody else? Why are they on the list? Because the Gentiles were living in a culture and in cities where all of these idol worship ceremonies were being performed. And a lot of that was animal sacrifice, the eating of blood, and strangled animals with the blood in them, okay? And a lot of that was their ritual. That comes up, by the way, in Paul in 1 Corinthians. Doesn't he talk about that? Don't offend your brother by eating certain things. And so we have to understand that the world in which these people lived, it's not our world, obviously, But a lot of those Gentiles were part of religious cults. And now the the folks in Jerusalem are saying you have to give that up, along with sexual immorality. And why would they do that? Because there is a complete ban on on idol worship, idolatry. By the way, even the sexual things were part of the idol worship. Uh, uh, prostitution and other such things, all right? So you need to understand that 
part of this was that they had to give up anything that was connected to idol worship. Everybody understand that? Okay. And one can argue that that's still true for today. Think of all the things in our culture that become idols for people. Okay. And we, and we need to give those up. All right. You know, let me just say this, and I know we're on the air. It really, and maybe I'm offending you. It bothers me when I go to someone's house and you walk up to the front door and there's a Buddha right next to the door of a Christian home. Now, I don't know, maybe that doesn't bother anybody. I had somebody I shared that with and, and the person said, well, that was just decoration in the garden. And I suppose it was, all right? I don't think they worship the Buddha. But what are you doing? You're bringing in, no, you're bringing in something from a foreign religion, a symbol of a foreign religion. Yes? And I, I think one is foolish. I would not want to do that on my property. I'm, I'm not superstitious. I, I know the powers of darkness. They're real, by the way. Okay? By the way, let me, since we're on this subject, uh, how many of you, when you moved into your house, had a blessing? Did you? Anybody? Just the three of us? We did. Every house we move into, we have a blessing. And you know what part of the blessing is? This is, this is new to you. We ask God to remove whatever evil may have been here in previous, with previous people to remove it. And that's one thing. And secondly that God would place his guardian angels on the corners of this house, this property, and protect all who come, that his peace, his presence, may, rest, may, may dwell among us. You guys haven't practiced that. And you know, uh, the reason I say that is I have had experience with people who moved into a house and strange things were happening. Anybody ever have that? Strange, you know, yeah, strange things. We had that with a family years ago. So you know what I did? Went to the house with, a, no, went to the house with a couple of other people from the church and asked, you remember this, Stephen? Maybe you do, you, I won't, we won't say who. Um, had a blessing that, Lord, whatever evil there is, please remove it. And later on, you know what we found? Tarot cards hidden in the house. They found them. They threw them out. Guess what happened? The strange things were gone. Okay. So you can, people can poo-poo that. I, I, I don't. I believe in the powers of evil. I believe in the powers of darkness, that it's real. And if you're playing around with it, expect it to be around you. Okay, so let me just, all right. Discipline for living a, li yeah, that's the other thing. Dis discipline for a living faith. We're living in an age, and we've had this discussion here, especially on sexual issues and otherwise. And that is we, with the attitude, well, you can do whatever you want. You know, as a, as a Christian, I'm free to do. No, that's not true. We are to live under the discipline of the Lord. We had this conversation today about the Ten Commandments. Think about this. Um, acute, uh, uh, what, what was that about? Anyway, oh, the Ten Commandments. Accuse people of, the wrong, of doing the wrongs you're doing. Oh, you're lying. When I'm lying, I accuse you of lying, and all of a sudden what? You're on the offensive. You're on the defensive, aren't you? I've got you. I got you cornered, right? Yeah. Whatever happened to lie, lie, cheat, and steal? Those are the three good things today. Lie, cheat, and steal. That'll get you what you want, right? Correct? No, oh, usually. And so living by faith isn't just the, it's obedience to the will of God, all right? And we're not perfect at that. Let's move on. Uh, the response, yes. All right, 22, where are we? Are we at 22? I don't know where that is. Oh. 
Okay. Not. Because, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yep. 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 We probably are. Really? Wow. Let's go on. Council letters. Verse 22. The apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas called Barsabbas, Silas, two men who were leaders among the brothers. With them they sent the following letter. To the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. That's the area up north, okay? We have heard that some went out from from us without our authorization. By the way, that's important. Without authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose men, some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Saul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word. Remember, that's the two they sent. What we are writing, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything except anything beyond the following requirements, abstention from food and uh, blood, strangled and sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these. So let's go back to this. Why would they send some of their own with Paul and si with not Paul and Silas, with Paul and Barnabas? Why would the council in Jerusalem send some of their own? No, as official, as official envoys from the, from the apostles and the elders. They just didn't send it with Paul and Barnabas, who they may not believe. They sent it officially with officials from Jerusalem, okay? As backup, if you will, but as official notice, okay? All right, let's move on and finish this up. The men were sent off and sent down to Antioch. By the way, Antioch is north of Jerusalem. I always think, we think when you go down from, we think you're going south, right? Not in that day. Everybody understand that? Okay. They didn't, it was, okay. So they went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together, delivered the letter. The people read it, were glad it's an encouraging message. Judas and Silas, prophets, said much to encourage them. After spending time, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who sent them. Paul and Barnabas stayed where they and many others taught and preached the word. Okay? So notice, we're going to talk about this. Notice how they deal with things. They open up, first of all, there has to be dealing with controversies if you want to write these down, the openness of, of dealing with controversy. Even with the Holy Spirit, as prevalent as he was, they had controversy. You see that? Okay? So don't think there's, you're going to find the perfect church or the perfect people. Everybody understand? And those who think they have become the perfect pastor or the perfect church are probably the most to be feared. No, seriously. Yeah, humility is a good thing. All right, number one, how do you solve them? First of all, face to face. You talk it through, which I'm afraid we're not doing these days. Oh, the personal connection. 
yes, I hate it, I'm sorry. And, and you know, it's, we talk about people can watch church on, on video. Well, that's great. But you know, what about face to face and shaking the hand, hugging, the, hugging your brother and sister in Christ? Huh? What about, what about actually listening, listening with your ears to the prayers of those around you and the singing of others? You know, we've lost that, the value of singing. I should preach a sermon on that. So the value of song in worship. We don't think about that. Now, for those of you who can't sing, like some of us men, we probably should not be part of that sermon. Yeah. But, oh, but seriously, you know, you think about, and I understand that, but oh my God. And anyway, so you do things face to face. Number two, you have to listen to one another. Doesn't mean you have to agree, but you have to listen. Okay? And don't, and this other one, number three, basically, find scriptural solutions. Scriptural solutions. And that doesn't mean you're going to find an answer to every question, but you will find guidance, correct? In the scriptures, yes. By the way, one of the things, that we had this discussion in Sunday Bible class, and we talked about controversies in the church. Um, when you don't know what to do, don't, don't do anything, right, just wait. And sometimes you have to wait on the Lord. The other thing is, sometimes when you don't know what to do, you try something and say, Lord, show us the way. Well, let's give it a shot. If we don't know it's from God, let, if some think, well, let's give it a try. And if it doesn't work, then we know. Hang on a minute. And if we don't know. I have heard of someone who stood up in a voters meeting and said to the people, God told me that we should do this. Ever hear that? Anybody ever hear that? I know, I bring this up. But I've heard it of folks. What's wrong with that? At least, at least. And the danger is that, is that one person takes on the leadership and the wisdom as opposed to the whole. That is why we have a voters meetings, okay? And, the vo and I'm thankful, I, I just had, we, by the way, I gotta tell you about Open Arms Pregnancy Clinic. I'm glad, we're so glad. But so many churches are, do not have well, no, they do not have power or authority over their own, um, what, decisions, like property. You know, thank God in our churches, we own our property, don't we? I mean, there's, we can make the stupid decisions, but we own our property. Think about churches that don't, and an outside group comes in and says, well, sorry, you're gone. Oh, was it back in '88? Guide us. And they didn't do anything. Yeah. That's a, there is a day. Oh, yeah. There, let's say there is a danger in saying, "Let the Holy Spirit guide," because it can turn to what? Laziness. No. I, I, well, I, yes, I agree with that. Yes. Do they? I don't think. Is that true? Uh, I find that hard to believe. Yeah, but well, that may be true here. Okay. I, I, okay, I agree, I, but I don't think that's true around the country. My old church said we own the property. You own the property. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You, the ones who sold the you guys couldn't sell the property and then divide it among the members? No. <laughs> hey, how do you like that one? Have you heard that one? We'll sell the property and we'll divide it among who's left. Yeah. 
Yes, I heard this. Yeah, 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 I know. Thank God we own our own property. We can at least, even we can be as stupid as we can be, but we still own our own property, right? Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. I don't know if that's true in the mail. I'm going to have to call my buddy. Well, okay. The other thing I want to say to you is don't, don't deny differences. Work through them. Okay? And sometimes you have to split the way, right? Sometimes. No, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Was that when I was here? Okay. I don't remember that. Don't deny, don't deny differences, work through them. Yeah, okay, well that was good. At least the person was honest. Yeah. Yeah, oh really, okay. Yeah, I'm strongly against. Well, and some people are, you know, there's always fear, right? By the way, I have found if you undertake for the Lord, the Lord will undertake for you, okay? And that doesn't mean you're always going to be successful, but you need to trust and see how God, yeah. All right, let's go on. Paul and Barnabas stay in Antioch. All right. Yes, yeah, so won't you be glad to be in glory in the kingdom of, in the church, the church in glory as opposed to the church on earth? But by, you know, and we're always going to have these struggles. We always are. You just have to be careful. And, uh, you know, I had, when I was circuit counselor, and then I, by, by the way, you want to, the other thing, what was, what else? The reconciler. Oh, be a reconciler in church. That's probably the worst job in the world because it never wins. And I had someone, I'm not going to say who, came to me and said, well, you really blew that one, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought, well, I wasn't alone. You were there. <laughs> but yeah, we do blow things, right? And uh, the devil works overtime and he loves, he loves, he loves. All right, let's move on. Last part. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach and see how they're doing. That's a great idea, isn't it? Let's go back and check them out. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, but Paul didn't think it was wise because he deserted them in Pamphylia and had, and had not continued with them in the work. So they had a sharp disagreement. Now, before we go on, why do you think... John Mark left, and uh, he, why would he desert them, and why would it bother Paul that he did not continue on in the work? Well, I think there's some, I think there's some indication. Well, I think if, Paul, if you know Paul at all, uh, John Mark wasn't with him. He left, and why would we take him back now, you know? Yeah, well, give him a second chance, but also I can see Paul saying, Paul may not have been the nicest guy in the world, but I can see Paul saying, you know, no, he left us once. Let's just go back and do it ourselves. And, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe Paul had a thing against the kid, too. You know, maybe the kid was a pain in the, in the took us. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so, you know, who knows? There was something there, and let's, let's deal with it honestly. You know, people have disagreements, right? So, what did they do? They parted their ways, okay? Sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to part your ways. And, huh? Well, yeah. It, well, that's true. That's true, and we're coming to the map. The other, well, yes, okay, they did. Now they have two missionary teams. Let's go to the map. The new one I gave you looks like this. Not the first one, the new one, which is Paul's second missionary journey. See that? So they go down to Jerusalem in the lower right, and then they go up to Antioch. See Antioch up, in, up north, 
And you can see then Barnabas and Mark go down to Cyprus. By the way, Cyprus was what? There you go. Barnabas went there, and Mark went with him. Maybe they had family there, okay? That was where he was, that was his home. Yes, I'm sorry. So maybe that was a good thing. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Now, we see something amazing, which probably none of them knew at the time of their separation. Paul and Silas, they traveled to Tarsus, which was Paul's hometown. But they don't stay there. They move on to Derby. They revisit Derby. Remember Lystra? That's where Paul was stoned and left for dead. Remember that? Then they go to Iconium. They tried to stone him there. And then they go up to Antioch, where had they been? Now, now comes a major shift. Instead of going down to, where was the first one? Instead of going south, to the, to the ocean, to the Mediterranean Sea. That's, remember, that's the way they came from. Now what did they do? Oh, they make a major decision. And that is, instead of going south and returning to Jerusalem or Antioch, they decide, well, let's go over to Asia. Let's go over to the, is that the Adriatic Sea there? Help me out, people. Is that the Adriatic? Then they cross over the Adriatic. This is the second missionary. And they go to these towns in Macedonia, north in Greece. And then that will lead them down to Athens and over to Ephesus or Corinth and over. This is huge. I think what happened was I don't have, I know all the details, but I think somewhere in this journey, the Holy Spirit said to Paul and his buddy, who? Silas. Silas. Or Paul said, why don't we go over to Greek, Greece? Why don't we, instead of going back south, let's just keep going north and northwest and go new places, Yes. And I don't think that would have happened if, no, I don't think that would have happened with Barnabas and John. They would not have gone. Right? Maybe. And I think with Silas, I don't know enough about Silas, I have to study him a little bit more, but with Silas and knowing Paul's temperament of trying something new, he decided, let's just go and see what happens. Because, you know, there were Jewish synagogues in those towns, right? Let's just go and see what happens, which was a major shift in early Christianity. It took Christianity to Greece, and from Greece was the foothold to Europe. Isn't that amazing? So I think somewhere in this whole division of Barnabas and John was, yeah, it turned out, and it wasn't just two, two teams now. I think that Paul, he would, if he had been with Barnabas, Barnabas would have said, no, let's just go back down to Antioch. I'd say, let's just go back. And I think the Holy Spirit knew that. But, Where, what verse, where are you? Chapter 16, verse 7. Oh, you're in the next chapter. Well, you can't go to the next chapter. Well, I know we are, but you can't go there yet. Oh, go down into Asia. I had to go, yeah, okay. Well, I knew, I knew that the, the Lord did something. All right. Anyway, so, um, what do I want to say? One, two, three, and four. Um, part of this, also, one other thing. Um, have, we must have apostolic vision. And what do I mean by that? Just don't think about what you want or what's important to you. And have an apostolic... Let me just say this. 
I think it's very important that churches individually have an apostolic vision, and part of that is giving to world missions. Let me say that. I, most churches I know of give very little or nothing to world missions. Forgive me, I'm getting on my soapbox now. That to me is a sign of narrow-minded self-serving, and God doesn't bless that. Yeah, just take care of your own. And, we, and to give 10%, you can give 5%, I don't care. But you don't give it if it's left over. You give it off the top. We had somebody say, forgive me, well, why don't we take care of our, when the pantry was having its trouble, why don't we just take care of ourselves first? If we have anything left over, we can give that to missions. Sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, I see. It sounds very sensible, doesn't it? You betcha. The problem is, God's going to sit in heaven. The Spirit of Jesus is going to say, why do I need to help those people? They're taking care of themselves. Seriously. Oh, I believe that. I, I, that's terrible. So, yep. And they wonder why. You, ever have, you should tell people, well, why don't you give a tithe to the Lord? I, by the way, you do that in your personal life to give it off the top, not what's left over. Not ever, we, Debbie and I did that when we were first married because we didn't have any money. We'd look in the checkbook and think about this back in the 70s. If we had 20 bucks left, can you imagine that? 20 bucks, well, what are we going to put in the offering today, Deb? I'll write a check out for five bucks <laughs> or for ten dollars. No, we wouldn't give ten. Maybe five. Well, we'll wait till next week. Until you come to the point of saying we're giving to the Lord first and he has to provide, guess what happens? It works. It works. It's crazy, but it works. All right. Next week, people. Uh, what's the reading for next week, Marlene? Chapter 16 through 17... 15, right? Something like that? I think that's what it is. So read all of chapter 16, lesson 3, and uh, we'll go through it. All right? All right, let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Spirit, bless us, be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us know. Oh, goodbye. Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs>